Okay, thanks. So the title of the meeting is What Do, what do Marxists Say About Gender and Sexuality? And I think um, quite a common, common answer that you will come across is, well, nothing really, because Marx uh, only ever talked about workers and uh, bosses and e economics and didn't really understand anything about oppression. And I think the first thing to say is that that is not true. That not only uh, is there a, quite a, um, a, a lot to be found in the writings, not just of Marx and Engels themselves, but of people who follow in the Marxist tradition on the question of oppression, but also people who call themselves Marxists uh, have, uh, have frequently been in the forefront of campaigns around the question of um, oppression. I mean, going back to the Communist Manifesto, for example, Marx talks about the... Bo the, the, um, the uh, what does he call it? The bourgeois claptrap that is talked about the family. He talks about how in the bourgeois family the, women, the woman is seen as a mere instrument of production and the point of communism is to free women from being mere instruments of, uh, mere instruments of um, production. Uh, going through to Engels who wrote a groundbreaking book on the origins of the family and... Uh, uh, um, somebody remind me. The origin of the fa family, private property, and the state, uh, which really traces the origins of women's oppression to the, to, 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 to the development of the family, calls it the world's historic defeat of the female sex, and so on, and provides an analysis of where that oppression um, of where that oppression comes from, through to um, a whole uh, a host of women in the revolutionary Marxist tradition, such as Alexandra uh, Kollontai, Clara Zetkin, Rosa Luxemburg. You know, people how people who have really theorised and led uh, in, these, uh, in these situations. And the same is true when you talk about the question of fights against um, LGBT oppression. That if you look at places like, um, uh, if you look at what happened in the Russian Revolution, uh, in, in, in terms of the decriminalising of homosexuality, very, very advanced uh, positions on the question of homosexuality for their time. If you look at what was happening in Weimar Germany in the early part of the 20th century, where the key people campaigning around, um, uh, around issues of sexuality were, came from the Marxist um, tradition. If you look at um, the work of... Um, I don't know, I've forgotten names today, Feinberg, who's the, who, who, who wrote a, a, a book called um, Transgender Warriors, again from a Marxist position, explaining the roots of, uh, of, of transgender, transgender oppression and resistance, that this has very much been something that is part of and within the, uh, part of and within the Marxist tradition. So that's the first thing that I want to say. Um, and I, 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 the, the place I really want to start is with a contradiction, which is that it seems very much that if you look at a lot of the, um, uh, you know, kind of official uh, instruments of society, that we have kind of got somewhere, you know, that we have equal marriage, that we have the Equalities Legislation of 2010, which makes it illegal to discriminate against people on the grounds of sex or gender or sexual, or, uh, uh, sexual orientation and so on, that if you look in popular culture, um, certainly you can see all sorts of images and quite popular uh, uh, TV series where uh, trans characters are treated sympathetically, LGBT characters are treated sympathetically, uh, and you can begin to think that really perhaps we've, that, that really perhaps we've, we've got somewhere in terms of the fighting oppression on the grounds of gender and sexuality. And yet that oppression is still very much with us. You only have to think back to... Uh, uh, um, for example, the suicide of Lucy Meadows, driven to commit suicide because of the uh, uh, vilification of her in the, in, uh, in the press following her transition when she was a, 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 a teacher in the school, uh, to uh, more recently Vicky Thompson, who uh, uh, died in a male prison, a transgender woman, uh, where the state refused to accept her status as a woman, for something that happens quite commonly, and um, sent her to a male prison. Whether you look at statistics around um, the question of either domestic violence or in terms of LGBT people, the question of homelessness, of uh, access to services and so on, we know that very much there is still a question of oppression, that, that a lot of people in schools will say, that being a young LGBT person in the school is still a very, very difficult time where you are um, uh, uh, subject to 
um, abuse and so on. Now that will vary a lot depending on what happens in your schools, whether the teachers have organised inside your school and it is something that is beginning to be challenged, but still large numbers of LGBT people will talk about um, their experience of school in a very negative way. So why is that oppression still with us? And I want to start by just looking at two types of explanations that I think are false and why I think Marxism is a much better tool for being able to explain oppression. Um, the first type of uh, explanations really are what I would call biological determinism, the idea that there is something genetically different about men and women. I guess most famously publicised in a book called um, Men Are From Men are from Mars, women are from Venus, which, you know, talked about chemical differences in men's and women's brains and how this, you know, leads them to behave um, differently and, uh, uh, and so on. And, you know, th these sort of things are really quite um, dominant in society, aren't they? You know, from the minute that a baby is born, what's the first question that is asked is, is it a boy or a girl? And this very much conditions the way in which people continue to be treated. Actually, in America, you know, on a, on, a, on, a, on a fairly regular basis, very intrusive surgery is carried out on newborn babies because they can't tell whether they're a boy or a girl and they think they should be one or the other. So somebody makes a decision and surgically tries to physically make them one or the other in, 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 in quite a horrific, uh, um, a, a horrific way. For some unknown reason, this is very important because we need to be able to put on your passport or on your birth certificate or whatever it might be, whether or not you are... Um, whether, um, whether or not you are, you are male or female. So, um, does this have any kind of basis in biology? And, and, and re fairly recently, there was actually quite a popular idea inside the LGBT movement that there was a gay gene, that there was a gene that made you gay. And some people quite like this because they thought, well, it means that it's not our fault. You know, we didn't make this choice, so you can't discriminate against us because we couldn't help it because we were born with this gene. Now, I think there are a whole number of problems with that sort of attitude. Um, first, I don't think it even begins to account for the huge variety in sexual behaviour that, um, that you see in human society. The idea that you can, you know, that somebody who might be married but have occasional affair, a, a man who might be married but have occasional affairs with a man, a man who might be living an openly gay lifestyle, somebody who might be in a prison engaging in, uh, in gay sex or in somewhere like the um, mines in South Africa where people are segregated by sex and engage in homo homosexual sexual activities which sometimes um, they enjoy, that you might be somebody experimenting, you might only experiment once, you might experiment and decide you quite like it, you might change what you like as you go throughout your life, the huge variety that exists. The idea that that can be explained by a gene, I think is really, uh, 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 really, really just, doesn't, uh, just doesn't work. And at its worst, it of course opens up that whole idea, oh well these poor people, they've just got this wrong gene, um, they're not normal in some way, and actually maybe we can even interfere with their genetics and get rid of it somehow. So it can also lead to some extremely um, reactionary, uh, to, to, to some extremely reactionary ideas. It's quite interesting that one of the things that's been happening as you've had a growth in the LGBT movement recently that has started to want to go beyond the binary of male and female, uh, or, or, uh, or of gay and straight, and is beginning to develop a theory around that, that also the science is actually starting to catch up and to say that actually it is not true that uh, it's that easy to say whether somebody is, uh, is, 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 is male or female. So this is John Ackerman from the Sexual Development and Endocrinology uh, Department at the uh, UCL Institute of Child Health, who says, I think there's much greater diversity within male or female, and there is certainly an area of overlap where some people can't easily define themselves within the binary structure, and they go on to talk about um, biology being a, uh, being a spectrum. Um, by the way, they give quite an interesting example of somebody, a 70-year-old man who went into um, hospital for a hernia operation, he'd fathered four children, and while they were operating on him, they discovered that he had a womb, you know, which kind of makes you, makes you think, really. And um, this is... Uh, Another quote from uh, Eric Villain, who is the de director of the Center for uh, Genetic-Based Biology at the University of California, Los Angeles. And he is talking about what is it that really makes somebody a man or a woman, male or female. He talks about hormones, anatomy, cells, chromosomes. He says, my feeling is that since there is not one biological parameter that takes over every other parameter, at the end of the day, um, uh, 
gender identity seems to be the most reasonable parameter. In other words, if you want to know what gender somebody is, ask them. What gender do they identify with? And it's quite interesting that the science is actually catching up with what um, a lot of the um, uh, LGBT community has been saying. So I think that biological determinism doesn't work on a whole range of levels. Um, the next group of uh, the next group of examples that I want to talk about really are kind of what I would call idealistic explanations, which just take for granted that there will be sexism, that there will be oppression, um, tries, to, tries to explain it a bit, to describe it a bit, but doesn't really give it an explanation that's rooted in society or that, or that, or that, or that talks about change. Various forms of um, identity politics, which in their modern form, uh, I guess you come across when, you, you know, if people at university, you might have heard of intersectionality theory, of privilege theory, and so on. Um, which I think it has to be said in many ways, people are coming at it from the point of view of wanting to fight oppression and wanting to examine oppression, which is a good thing, and wanting to talk about how different oppressions are linked up, which is also a good thing, but actually have no fundamental explanation beyond the fact that you can have a multiplicity of oppressions, somehow they all cross over, their sum is greater than the total of their parts, and so their total is greater than the sum of their parts, and so on, and this is how people should identify and begin to explain themselves, and so on which can often be quite a good way of explaining the way that you can be affected by racism and sexism and so on, but goes very little beyond that to say why those ideas should, uh, 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 should exist in the first place or to provide any kind of solution beyond being aware, raising your own consciousness, raising the consciousness of others, being aware of your privilege and so on and so forth, none of which really help us to go beyond the individual in terms of changing, of changing society. And, or if you think about, um, you know, people may have come across queer theory, which quite often when it comes to an attempt to change society can come down to things like changing the language that you use and that somehow the discourse that we use, by changing that we can begin to change um, uh, uh, the ideas in people's heads and all of these things operate at a level of ideas. I'll come back to mention them a little bit later about why I think they, they, they have, had, uh, have had a resurgence but what none of these ideas do is explain either how the levels of sexism, of LGBT oppression, of homophobia and transphobia change over time. In other words, at certain periods in certain parts of the world, you can have a high level of oppression. At other periods, there can be a high level of resistance to that oppression, or, there, or, 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 or the oppression can seem to not be there. How does that change, both in time and place? How is there a history of both repression and resistance. In other words, how do we account for change within that whole um, for change within that whole within that whole story? And the other thing that I think is interesting, which I will look at within that, which comes back to these ideas, is is the fact that whenever you have resistance to oppression, you also have the argument about what form that resistance should take, whether it should be a safe campaign or whether it should be a radical campaign. But it ultimately comes down to the arguments between. Um, reform or revolution. Okay, and, that, and, and, and I think that the reason that Marxism can explain these things is because Marxism is a, uh, is, is a historical scientific method that analyzes where ideas come from and how they change. So Marx, uh, uh, Marx talked about um, uh, what he called being determining consciousness. In other words, the material world in which we found ourselves at any particular point in time having an effect on the ideas inside our heads. So he said, the mode of production of material life conditions the general process of social, political, and intellectual life. It is not the consciousness of men, he's using the language of his time there, that determines their existence, but their social existence that determines their consciousness. In other words, there is something about the actual conditions in which people live that mean that particular ideas are prominent at any particular time. And in particular, when we talk about oppression based around the question of gender and sexuality, that has to take into account the material reality of the family. The, 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 the idea that at the, at the base of society is this nuclear family with a man and a woman that have very traditional gender-based roles within that and that are primarily responsible for the care of young children and for educating them and for keeping them healthy and... Uh, uh, um, um, and, uh, uh, and so on, and that the reason that that continues, it continues to persist and the reason that it's changed is because of the differing needs of the differing classes within society, the way that has, that has shaped the way that society, uh, that, that has shaped the way that society, uh, that, that society has changed. So, um, so, so I want to start just with talking about the family, um, uh, 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 talking about the family a little bit, because the ruling class 
actually has quite a, a contradictory attitude towards the, toward, towards, toward, towards the family. Um, you know, in the Communist Manifesto, which I mentioned before, Marx and Engels kind of outlined the way in which the, uh, the Industrial Revolution was pulling people out of the kind of feudal peasant-based family, which was, could have been quite a kind of you know, self-sufficient, fairly independent, productive unit in itself, pulling people out of that into work in the, uh, in the, in the, in the big factories, which meant that people were just being super exploited to the extent that people were working when they were, women were working when they were heavily pregnant, they were sometimes even giving birth on the factory floor, very young children were being pulled into work in the workplaces. And at the same time, you began to see, in these, as these industrial centres developed, that also people began to gather in different social groups than they had been in the past. So, for example, you saw the development of what were called molly houses, where men could go and dress as women and uh, uh, act out um, uh, and act out different different roles and so on. So, you, it was, so Marx and Engels actually at that point thought that the, that the family, as it had existed, was uh, um, um, was in fact dis, uh, was, 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 was in fact disappearing. But what a number of Marxists. Um, um, have analysed is the way in which that was actually quite a contradictory process for the ruling class because yes they wanted to pull people into the factories and exploit them but they also <coughs> had, an, uh, 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 um, had a need for the, for, for, for the family. So this is a uh, gay historian John Domenio writing in 1992. On the one hand capitalism continually weakens the material foundation of family life making it possible for individuals to live outside the family and for a lesbian and gay male identity to develop. On the other hand, it needs to push men and women into families, at least long enough to reproduce the next generation of workers. The elevation of the family to ideological preeminence guarantees that a capitalist society will reproduce not just children, but heterosexism and homophobia. In the most profound sense, capitalism is the, uh, capitalism is the problem. And so, so, in other words, the ruling class started to realise that actually, in terms of their long-term profitability, having children die at a very young age wasn't really sustainable and that they needed a means to reproduce the next generation of workers to be exploited. And that the means of that was the fact... Now, you could have said, OK, well, then why didn't the workers just take over the means of production and collectivise them and collectivise childcare and so on? Well, there were actually movements that talked about that sort of thing around the Chartists and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, they were defeated. And therefore, workers who also didn't like the fact that their children were being dragged into the factories and, uh, and so on and the ruling class had a bit of a coming together in terms of the push for uh, uh, remoulding the family along the lines of the existing bourgeois family, at least in theory, where in theory the woman um, stayed at home and the men went out to work. They didn't really work very hard in the bourgeois family, but this is what we were supposed to pretend while the woman stayed at home and did the embroidery or something like that. So the idea was that we would have this nice nuclear family which would look after and raise the children uh, while the men were paid what was going to be called a family wage, enough to feed the family. Now, of course, in reality, capitalism being an exploitative system, the family wage never actually came to... Uh, uh, um, never actually came... To, uh, to fruition. But what's interesting is that there was a raft of legislation required to make this happen. This wasn't something natural. This wasn't people going back to a natural way of living of a man with a woman looking after the children. This was something that required huge intervention by the state to create. And by the way, at the same time, this is where people first started to talk about the category of a homosexual person. Whereas in the past, it was acts, sexual acts that had been outlawed and vilified by the church because they didn't like the idea that people were having sex and it wasn't for procreation. So they talked about it being against the nature of God and blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, and, and what they did was they tended to lump together all sorts of sexual acts that didn't result in children. So they included, for example, under the definition of sodomy, um, having sex with animals. It always surprises me how often this legislation has to be implemented and makes you think that it has used to actually maybe had to had happens quite a lot in the past because there's a hell of a lot of, a hell of, a lot of legislation around this period includes that it's an offence to, uh, to have, 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 um, have sex with animals. With, with, with the attempt to mould this new family, instead of it just being a question of outlawing acts, which anybody could engage in, this became uh, the, the, the a homosexual. The word a homosexual person started to be used for the first time, and to become criminalised in the Criminal Law Amendment Act, under which most famously Oscar Wilde was tried in 1895. And so this is the period where really this idea that there are these people that are somehow outside the nuclear family don't fit into the rest of society uh, became to be established, and therefore. Uh, and also at which those gender roles that we still live with today, the very stereotypical gender, role, uh, gender roles, came to be, um, came to be um, dominant um, within society. So 
so very much the establishment of the modern nuclear family conditioned um, both gender and sexuality. So uh, in other words, both women's oppression and um, uh, LG, L, L, um, L, LGBT oppression. So what's interesting is that people fighting back against capitalism since that period have also fought against that oppression. They fought against LGBT oppression and they fought against um, and they fought against women's oppression. They fought against the stereotypes. Um, you know, Lenin in the Russian Revolution very much talked about the revolution being a festival of the oppressed, about it bringing everybody on the streets together to fight for a better society. He talked about how revolutionaries have to be the tribune of the oppressed because we want to bring the working class together to fight, and therefore we have to overcome all of those um, 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 all of those di uh, divisions. And in 1917, they did indeed um, decriminalise homosexuality. Marxists at the time in the German Social Democratic Party were raising the rights of homosexual people in the, um, uh, in, the in the German Parliament. Hirschfeld was carrying out the first um, uh, experiments with transsexual um, surgery and um, and so on. Again, in the second round of uh, mass struggle against the system, if you like, in the 1960s and early 1970s, once again, the struggle against the system very much took with it the fight against oppression and the fight for liberation um, of uh, women and LGBT people. Most famously, the Stonewall riot uh, that launched the modern um, gay liberation movement, where for three days people rioted um, against the police, you know, you had people, you know, lots of, lots of, uh, lots of, lots of Latino working class um, tr um, transsexual women actually uh, were often leading it, and you know, there's a lot of arguments because they were kind of subsequently written out of a lot of the history of Stonewall, um, and, you know, involved in chucking trash cans at um, police cars and so on. And when they called themselves the Gay Liberation Front, the movement that was born out of that, they did so in solidarity with the fight of the Vietnamese Liberation Front against American imperialism and so on. This was a time of the black power and civil rights in America. So again, very much a coming together with the fight against oppression, with the fight against the system. Their founding statement said, we are a group of men and women formed with the realization that complete sexual liberation cannot come about until existing social institutions are abolished. We are going to be who we are. Babylon has forced us to commit to one thing, revolution. That was the founding statement of the gay liberation movement. They were clearly identified with revolution and the fight for a, um, 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 and the fight for a better society. And you see it today in any of the uprisings that have taken place recently. In Gezi Park in <coughs> Turkey, where you saw the rainbow flags alongside the socialist groups, the Muslim groups and so on that were fighting uh, inside Gezi Park. In Athens, the mass strikes you've seen the, you've seen the gay movement also being, uh, being part of that. The movement around refugees, actually, has been quite interesting. The number of groups that have grown up around that, that are, that are very much linking the fight uh, uh, against LGBT oppression with the fight for, um, with the fight for, um, for, for, for refugees. We've seen the emergence of a whole number of radical groups who want to, who want to challenge society and are also presenting a more diverse range of, uh, range of identities. And you can see this, you know, I think around the movement around Corbyn, where people come out onto the streets, a whole number of young people who very much see their identity in terms of their gender and their sexuality being part of their rebellion against society. They don't want to fit into the straitjacket that capitalism has forced them into. And part of their fight against capitalism is to fight against that, is to fight against that, um, is to, is to fight against that straitjacket. But there is a difference here, and this comes back to the theories that I talked about at the beginning. And that is, in the early struggles in the early part of the century, and the, in, 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 through to the 1960s and 1970s, Marxism was very much a key theoretical part of the movement. By the time you get to the present day, you get, you get, by the time you get to the present day, you find that in the intervening period, the theories that grew up began to reject Marxism. As the class struggle went down in the 1980s, so the theories that arose began to reject the idea that class could explain anything. Indeed, began to reject the idea that anything could be explained at all. This, you know, generally came to be known as postmodernism. This idea that. You know, you couldn't really have these overarching theories that try to attempt to explain anything. And therefore, you get left with these theories that try to explain things in the realms of ideas. They try to explain one oppression separate from another oppression. And they don't talk about how you can really, they don't talk about how you can fundamentally change anything. And therefore, the radical link with Marxism 
and the movement has been broken. And that's why you tend to see a retreat into um, identity politics, which you see an echo of in intersectionality and privilege theory. I don't think it's quite the same, because I think the movement is now starting to radicalise a little bit more. This isn't a movement that is going down. For me, this is a movement that is still radicalising. So these arguments have to be fought for, because the question is, what is going to happen to the new, um, what is going to happen to the new emerging movement? Because I think it actually faces a bit of a, it faces a bit of a challenge, which is that either the new movement links with the working class in order to go forward and understands the way in which in, in, in which class is important and can, uh, and can challenge oppression, or it turns in on itself and accommodates within the system. And you can already see some, some places where this is beginning to happen. I don't know if people have followed the arguments between Peter Tatchell and some people in the student movement, um, the arguments with uh, Germaine Greer and um, some trans women. You can begin to see how, if without that, without that unifying factor of class, that the seeds are there within the movement to, 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 to implode upon itself. And I think instead we have to reinforce why class matters. Class matters because it can explain why we have the family, why we have oppression, how oppression is shaped. There is a very different experience if you are um, Will Smith's son, who is now modelling women's wear for Louis Vuitton, right? He is not going to get beaten up for wearing a dress at work. It's a very different thing if you're a bus driver, I should imagine. You know, class actually shapes your experience of oppression, as well as explaining where it comes from, but most importantly, it poses a unifying solution. Because the way to fight back, when we start to fight back collectively against the system, we are forced to overcome those oppressions, whether it be on the question of race, on the question of gen gender, or on, the, uh, um, or on the question of sexuality. So for us, the challenge is to be involved with the new movement as it is developing, but to make class centre stage in that movement.